folks, I, I think we're going to go ahead and get started. Uh, so the next segment of our agenda will highlight regional projects and initiatives related to uh, energy and water. Please help me welcome Mr. Mike Hightower, uh, who is the Program Director for, New Mexico, for the New Mexico Produced Water Consortium. He'll be speaking today on the topic of regional desalination uh, initiatives. So welcome, Mike. Thank you. Although maybe you shouldn't clap until after you hear what I have to say. <laughs> so uh, a couple of background real quickly. I've uh, been working in this area for about 20 years. I was started with the San, uh, San Diego National Labs and uh, a group with the, between NETL, National Energy Technology Lab, Los Alamos and San Diego. Looking at some of the issues back in 2001 about water demands for the energy sector. And we put together a report for the DOE, uh, we called it Energy Water Interdependencies, and uh, Senator Domenici wanted a presentation in front of Congress a year later, about 2004. He gave us a format, and we could get energy water interdependencies onto the format that they needed at uh, the, the Senate. So we had a discussion with a lady by the name of Robin Newmark from Los, from uh, Lawrence Livermore National Lab suggested that we change it to the energy water nexus because it would fit the format that the uh, Congress needed. That's what we did and I told Robin, I don't think anybody's ever going to use energy water nexus as <laughs> something that they'll use. It's, uh, it's kind of cliche-ish and here we are 20 years later and energy water nexus is, is everywhere. So, now you know where the term came from, it was because we couldn't fit the, the name interdependencies on a PowerPoint presentation for the U.S. <laughs> the second thing that I want to talk about, we're going to talk today about energy and water associated with, with um, water on tribal lands and the, the opportunity with desalination as a technology for water treatment and renewable energy to try and, and bring water to, to, uh, to an area that doesn't have water. So I want everybody that knows someone on the reservation that hauls water to raise their hand. I'd like the people in D.C. to look around and see how many people here know someone who today, 2023, hauls water. A lot of people. So I've been working with Arvin Trujillo uh, where's Arvin? for about 20 years uh, when I was at Sandia trying to figure out ways to support uh, the Navajo Nation and, and the tribes, uh, you know, the Koreas also, and, and Utes, and getting water to this remote areas of the reservation. So uh, I also do a lot of work with the New Mexico Desalination Association. So this presentation is, is associated with the work that we're doing through that organization to support the development of desalination technologies and renewable energy technologies to bring water to this a lot of the rural communities in the state of New Mexico and to some of the uh, larger uh, communities in New Mexico. So this is a little bit about uh, New Mexico Desalination Association. We're really set up to try and provide engineering information, background information to the public. You'll get a set of these slides, so yeah. um, opportunities to get a hold of us if you want to move forward. I think there's, there's the website that you can get information on on the, the association. But of course, the activities are focused on bringing new water supplies from non-traditional water resources through desalination <coughs> to use by communities in New Mexico. Uh, we talked about the tree ring data from the University of Arizona that suggests how long these droughts have been here. Um, and the issue that I, I'm trying to point out with this, this is data that I put together with 50 year averages over the last 2,000 years. And the point is, it's kind of, it's not great, but it does show that we've had these arid cycles uh, in, in the western U.S. Um, for the last 2,000 years, and we're in one of those arid cycles. It is one of the worst arid cycles that we've had over the last 2,000 years. And we're at, um, you know, significantly reduced um, water supplies over what we've seen in even the 1880s or 1890s. And so we're at a point where it's probably not going to get much worse, but we still have about 100 years of uh, this arid cycle to deal with. Okay. And we're going to have to figure out how to address water supply issues to support the populations for the western states. And uh, the term that we use, you know, agua espita, you know, 
water's life. That's uh, a big deal in, in, in the Southwest. So, uh, But we're not the only groups in the Southwest that are seeing water supply issues. We have not managed our water resources in this country very well. Um, we have a lot of the major aquifers across the country that are under significant stress. But you can see the state of New Mexico and look at the groundwater supplies uh, around us. All the states in the west and many states in, and even the northeast and in the southeast are experiencing uh, water issues. So uh, we have to look at new supplies, new resources to supplement our current freshwater supplies. To do that, we really need to look at non-traditional water sources, and that includes uh, desalination of brackish water uh, or seawater. Um, this is now a big deal uh, within the U.S. government. The U.S. EPA has a water reuse action plan, which is focused on looking at non-traditional water resources, using those to supplement water supplies across the country. Um, and UN uh, has started a uh, concept around one water where every water is valuable, every water has an opportunity to be used, and we have to treat it, which requires energy, but that we've got to look at these non-traditional water resources as the water of the future. So um, one of the things that I like to point out is if you, everyone says, yeah, you can't do desal, it's too expensive. If you look at the cost of desal uh, over the last uh, 30 years, we brought the cost of desal down by a factor of uh, four or five uh, from what it was in the 1970s. Um, and if you uh, look at the, the trend that you see in the United States over the last 15 years, is that municipal wastewater reuse has, has increased at about 15% a year, uh, which is a non-traditional water resource. And desal has been increasing at about 10% a year uh, in, in use. So, the fact that the cost of desal is now coming down, what we're seeing is that it is at equal to or less than the cost of bringing in new water from 100 or 200 miles away. Uh, here's an example from El Paso. They're not in New Mexico, but you wouldn't know it. They're, they're about, about half a block away from the state of New Mexico. But their resources in the Tularosa Basin, brackish water resources that they're treating, they're treating for about $500 a thousand gallons. They're now looking at bringing in uh, water supplies from about 80, fresh water supplies from about 80 miles away. The cost of bringing that water in from um, 80 miles away through a pipeline, because of the energy costs, are, are about five times that. So the point is, if you've got nearby brackish water resources, and you've got some local energy supplies, like renewable energy supplies, like we have in northwestern New Mexico, uh, the cost of the water is much less expensive using desalination of your local brackish water than it is to try to import water from 70 or 80 miles away. Uh, you know, we know that we have the Navajo Gallo pipeline, um, and that's important, but trying to bring that kind of fresh water all across the, the reservation probably has some, some issues. So we have a lot of local uh, brackish water in New Mexico and in the Four Corners region that we could use with renewable energy. Uh, you know, the energy water nexus currently on the reservation is diesel fuel in pickup trucks moving water uh, with 55 gallon barrels in the back of the pickup truck. That's an energy water nexus that we want to get away from. I'm suggesting that our energy water nexus here in northwestern New Mexico should be renewable energy tied in with local brackish water supplies so that we can get that water to the people that need it less expensively. So, here are the major basins. Uh, New Mexico has one of the largest supplies of brackish water in the country. Uh, some four billion acre feet, billion but B, billion acre feet of uh, recoverable and treatable uh, brackish water. Um, that's essentially um, a thousand year supply of the current water use in the state of New Mexico. So uh, water consumption in the state of New Mexico. So the point is, we have a lot of resources that we can take uh, advantage of. Specifically in the Four Corners region, you can see um, uh, the San Juan Basin has a lot. It's deeper, but has a lot of brackish water. Unfortunately, some of the wells, uh, it's a lot of sandstone, so they don't yield a lot of water. But I think for some of the local communities, uh, chapter house applications, 
or local communities, we can identify uh, approaches to treat that water and support um, development. Uh, a couple of things about the different basins in, in New Mexico. I'm using the Raton and Las Vegas basins. They're not really, uh, they're on the eastern side of the state in the mountains. Um, but basins down in the tier C around Rio Grande. The point is that even though we, we have a lot of freshwater resources we use, most of the aquifers that we have do have a levels of, um, of uh, saline water. That uh, with a lot of wells that exist, they're not all that deep if you look at the depths, that we can easily treat for um, small community supplies or uh, individual home supplies without a lot of expense. Um, we don't know as much about brackish water as we do fresh water. This is all of the wells within the state of New Mexico. This is from Stacey Timmons at New Mexico Tech, uh, the Bureau of, of Geology. We've got a lot of data on uh, fresh water. But you know, when you're drilling a well and you find brackish water, the first thing you do is say, well, we don't want to do any more drilling. Um, let's go find some fresh water. So we don't have a lot of data on brackish water. But we have, um, we do have enough data that shows that there's a lot of brackish resources that are generally shallow, uh, not too deep that we can cost effectively recover. Um, I do throw in produced water because in the San Juan Basin we have a lot of produced water developed by oil and gas that is somewhat shallow and pretty high quality brackish water. It's not as salty as some of the waters in other basins like the Permian Basin. We're talking about 10,000 TDS uh, to 20,000 TDS uh, to dissolve solids. Salts, which is not that hard to desalinate and with today's technologies. So there's a lot of opportunities for um, non-traditional water resource reuse in, in the state of New Mexico and specifically in, in the San Juan Basin. So. Uh, keep everybody on track. Uh, we have some issues, but we have some huge opportunities. And the opportunities kind of uh, uh, include, as we look at these new uh, energy sources, uh, we'll be looking at hydrogen. Hydrogen needs a lot of water. And so there's opportunities to use produced water, uh, treated produced water or treated brackish water to support um, those new energy opportunities. There's a, a lot of development of new desalination approaches that are less, less expensive. I think that we can utilize those resources for, for local chapter houses and, and local uh, uses. Um, so I think that what we're going to see is uh, uh, significant opportunities uh, for this continued nexus of energy and water, but in a way that we can use it beneficially for the needs that, that we have here. You know, as far as developing sustainable water supplies for the citizens of the north, northwestern New Mexico. So with that, hopefully that's an overview. Uh, maybe I need to take a question or two, but we're about on track, so for about one question. Yeah. Yes, ma'am, yeah? What, what's the cost for 1,000 gallons for New Mexico? I know you gave the example of El Paso, but I was curious about New Mexico. As far as, oh, uh, uh, this, we're looking at something on the order of four to five dollars, three, three to five dollars per thousand gallons for treated uh, brackish water. Okay. All right. If you got any questions? You know how I'll be present, presenting uh, later on this afternoon. But thanks very much. now to introduce uh, Professor Abhishek Roy Chowdhury from uh, Navajo Tech uh, University. Uh, he'll be speaking today on the Navajo Nation Water Purification Project, which is a collaborative effort between NTU, New Mexico Tech, and PESCO. So Abhishek, uh, welcome. Thank you, Kevin. Good morning, everyone. Uh, during the break, I was asking Kevin, do we have a like, you know, uh, slight change or not? Because trust me, is impossible to speak a professor to a podium okay so we love to like you know move around the room so that we can judge the uh, like you know students interest uh, about the topic so 
uh, and it will be a little bit difficult for me to access two screens. So, like you know, please bear with me if I'm just pointing something on this screen or this screen. Okay. So again, good morning uh, for those who are uh, like you know uh, who are visiting Navajo Nation uh, for the first time. Welcome, because we are sitting right across the boundary. And uh, these border towns, we like you know, uh, we always come for different purposes. So Gallup, Farmington, we kind of it's a broader Navajo Nation community for us. So my name is Abhishek Rajchaudhary. I'm from uh, Navajo Technical University. The project I'm going to talk about today is like in a collaboration. So uh, and I'm really proud uh, about this project because this is about our students. Okay, so. It's not about like you know technology. It's not about a university what is doing. It's a perfect example when you have students from a community need, and you are you are empowering them to solve that environmental problem. This is exactly what it looks like. So, uh, so now our nation again. We always brag about the beauty, as uh, uh, Crystal was mentioning. The geology is like you know mind blowing. So. I live in Gallup. I always travel every day 60 miles each way, and people usually ask, like, you know, why you live so far? Because I, I always uh, reply to them that if you have to drive every day with a uh, like, you know, background of Grand Canyon, you don't mind anything, like, you know. And 60 miles, no traffic or very limited traffic, exactly 60 minutes. I was in New Jersey for eight years, and usually 10 miles takes 45 minutes. So 60 miles, 60 minutes is nothing. Okay. So 270,000 square miles area with like you know breathtaking geological view is what Navajo Nation is. But on the other hand, and we always like you know always try to give some examples. So we are almost equal to the size of state of West Virginia. On the other hand, you remember the state of West Virginia with only two universities, okay? Navajo Technical University and Dini College. So that's what we are that's what we are going to talk about here that how universities on tribal lands can make difference. So Mike, just like, you know, a uh, few minutes ago was asking that how many uh, of you know someone who haul water? I will rephrase the question. How many of my students here from NTU haul water? Not you know, but you do, okay? So these are, so these are we are talking about folks who do it every day, or like you know more frequently, like in a few times a week. So we like you know. Uh, so this map is showing that 30 percent of the Navajo homes do not have running water. It's like you are opening a tap, you are getting water. It's very common outside Navajo Nation, but it's not common here. Okay. So what you have to do, you have to go and uh, so, I have, so you have to go and get your own water. Sometimes you have to travel 30, 40 miles each way. And that's the reality. I'm, I'm coming back to that, that why, why it is that. So on the other hand, we always try to like, you know, put reasons, right? Why you have to haul water. Something is related to climate change, something that we cannot like, you know, ignore because another phase of climate change is dropped and now our nation is in the receiving end. So uh, this is a graph that shows uh, since like, you know, since we started to document drought uh, back in 2000. Navajo Nation is almost like you know all the time within like you know uh, different drought category. Recently, D3, D4 is the severest form. Last two summers, we were very lucky to get a good amount of rainfall, but that only improved that D4 drought to D3. So technically, there is no way that we are going to come out of drought, and none of us have any like you know control over climate. So we cannot do anything, right? So we have to uh, like you know, acknowledge that. But on the other hand, Navajo Nation was exploited, like you know, for for centuries for mining. So mining started on Navajo Nation in mid 1800s with gold, copper, lead, silver. Then came uranium, like you know, mining era in 1900s. Then coal mining since 1960s. So what this legacy mine left? Uh, behind is enormous number of abandoned mines. We have over, like you know, exact number is 523 known abandoned uranium mine within that boundary of Navajo Nation. There are thousands more because those are undocumented. So, 
and they are more like you know coal and other abundant mineral mines. So our water is contaminated, underground water, our soil is contaminated, and for those abundant mines that are not properly capped, they are emitting radon like you know day in day out. So our water, air, and soil, everything got impact from. from mining. So, and that's why our people need to go out and get water. So I'm talking about my students who are not only taking classes, but they're also taking care of their families, right? So you have to accommodate their need. So all this picture taken by them, okay? So these are real pictures, not taken from internet. And what we have in our communities are livestock wells like this, that has encryption Warning, water is not safe for, safe for drinking or human uses, only for livestock use. That means this groundwater wells are contaminated with heavy metals. And there is no silver bullet of uh, analyzing this, uh, like in each of these wells, because they are contaminated with different things. So uh, I'm really thankful to Crystal and her office, <coughs> our nation Department of Water Resources. They gave us like an you know, access our students basically access to go there and get data. So this one of these maps were created by one of our students that shows all those livestock wells across like you know now our nation. So we counted 771 of them. Again, how they looks like? They looks like this. Warning water. So water is there, not for human use. So you can only like you know uh, use it for livestock usage. But we don't even like you know pay attention that those livestock are part of our like you know cycle as well. We consume those livestock. So if the livestock are getting exposed to those metals, it's coming back to us as well through bioaccumulation. So we took a mission. Uh, April 2020, during pandemic, two university presidents came together. So Dr. Guy from uh, NTU and Dr. Wells from New Mexico Tech. And they, dis they signed a MOU between these two industry along with PESCO. And we started our journey. So it's exactly three years when we are talking about. So we decided, OK, first, let's train our students how to address this problem. Number two, let's do something for the community. And we launched our NTU and NT Navajo Nation Water Purification Project. We always like you know, love to give sweet acronyms. It's N4WPP for us. And uh, again, it's a like you know a joint endeavor between two university and industry partner. How we can address this issue? And we know we cannot promise to uh, provide drinking water to community until or unless we have proper permits and certificates. So we decide, okay, let's start with cleaning these wells and leave it for the community for livestock use. We know what is happening. And sometimes people end up drinking those water because that's the easiest way to get water, right? Because going 30 miles, 40 miles, either each way or round trip costs money as well. And we are talking about communities in need. So uh, uh, PRRC, Petroleum Research uh, Recovery Center at New Mexico Tech, they developed this technology using hollow fiber membrane. Dr. Jinjia Yu is here. Uh, like, you know, uh, don't ask me technical questions, okay? So, but he's there. So, but these hollow fiber membranes are, like, you know, able to do desalinization, plus they are able to take out heavy metals and uranium from water. So, we tested real water from Navajo Nation, and we ran through the system, and we saw that. Is doing that like it's taking out the salinity plus it's taking out the metals completely from those water. Things looks very like you know uh, good and great in the labs, but think when you take it out the field things change completely. So in the process we decide okay so let's like you know work something in feasible way and let's take our students to that journey. So we decide that we are going to install this like in a filtration unit to our nation communities. But what we need, we need to select the sites. We need to understand the community's problem. Again, we are talking about a huge area, and like in every area has their own, like you know, different types of environmental problems in their water. So site selection is a key. Then the permit, like you know, and our students need to know that. Even if you are receiving enormous amount of money, it takes time. 
right? So if you have a filtration unit and you have money, you cannot just go to the tribal like in you know, communities and start installing them. You need to know the process. You need to do things right. That's what we are doing and we are training our students. The whole idea is we are going to hand over this filtration unit to the communities for free. But again, you need to train them as well how to take care of these things, right? So our students are getting trained at this moment, then they are going to train the community members. And then only we are going to finish that handover because otherwise it's never going to like you know work out in the longer run. And in that like you know pathway, we are leveraging to universities like you know education model. So we are recruiting students as high, like you know, as earlier in the high school stage. So they're coming to NTU, NTU is a tribal university. We have undergrad programs. We recently make national headlines that NTU is the first tribal university to offer PhD program. But again, it's a long road. Like, you know, we don't have any STEM graduate program yet. And that's why NMT is our sole, like, you know, strong collaborator, because we don't want our students to stop here. We want them to go for grad study, and they, then they can come back and serve their, like, you know, yeah. community. As Crystal was mentioning, like, you know, it will not put you on the chopping board anymore. You will be, like, you know, valued. So that's why we, we are creating this model, that classroom, classroom learning, how we can augment into the field, and then, like, you know, communication skills. So our students are getting hands-on experience on water science. They're going out with us. They're getting like you know sample collection, uh, like you know skill development analysis. But the key is again, is how you are working with Native American communities. Federal dollars does not make any sense to them until or unless you're talking to them into their language, right? I don't speak Navajo. I'm from India, but my students do. So I'm taking them to the chapter meetings. We are making scientific presentation. They're translating it for me. Okay. So the whole idea is, at the end of the process, we are getting resolution passed. Until or unless you have their support, the community support, you cannot just go out there and start collecting sample and analyzing them. You cannot, like, you know, tell them, "Hey, I have a great solution," but that trust is not there. So that's why we are showing them this is their own like you know community member who are part of NTU so they are like you know, speaking on our behalf it takes time it takes us like you know as we are talking about three years like you know time but what we have done we have developed this trust building mechanism so that's the key and in that process we are training our students so they right now they know how to speak like you know layman's term they know how to speak like in you know, scientific technical terms they are coming with us to national conferences. They are making like, a presentation. They are winning like you know uh, competition by competing with national universities. So a few weeks back, uh, there were AHEC national conference. NTU students won first, second, third prizes in the research category. So I'm really proud of this. So it's how you are talking to your community, how you are talking to scientific. Like you know, it's a perfect example how we are like, you know, combining Western science with tribal, like, you know, uh, TEK, we call it traditional, like, you know, uh, traditional ecological knowledge. So until or unless you have that uh, perfect plan, nothing can work out in uh, tribal lands at the project. So this is one of the units that are being, uh, like, you know, ready at our uh, PESCO's uh, facility in Farmington. And uh, the whole idea is that we are going to deploy this in the community. So the good thing about this technology is it can be scaled up or down. So this is the picture you're seeing that it can uh, clean 5,000 gallon water per day, but we can even scale it down to 500 gallon uh, per day, depending on what the community need. So, and again, our students are learning the engineering, they're learning the maintenance, and they're learning like, you know, long scale uh, operational usage as well. So as I mentioned that we started with high school, so uh, we are organizing annual water symposium, part of this N4WPP uh, uh, consortium, and we are inviting high school students to take part of that. So we are throwing water challenges to them, and they're coming up with a solution. So last year it happened in April, this year it will happen in November. Uh, we almost very close to uh, 
finalizing our place, but it will be in the Gallup area this time. Last time it happened at Farmington High School. So what happened? Like you know, so we gave them that water challenge. Challenges from the community water perspective. So they worked with their high school science teachers. And during the symposium day, now they're presenting. So they're competing uh, like you know uh, with each other and like you know we selected top schools or the top teams and we gave them scholarships so again it's a real way to tell them there is a path forward to go into the water like you know uh, science uh, field and they can make a like you know meaningful change of the contribution towards this uh, community crystal was there she was sharing her story how she became a water advocate and we have panels, we have different automation agencies gathered together to talk to our students. So, and data is key, right? We know that data sovereignty needs to be taken care of. Uh, now our nation has its own data sovereignty rules. So we are building data manage, database management platform. Because we are talking about creating water data that is really like, you know, uh, uh, sensitive to the community. So we are in the process of uh, creating our database management plan. We got Intera, we got uh, West Big Data Innovation Hub, uh, West in UC Berkeley uh, to be on board. So they are helping our students. And again, everything is being led by students. So that's, uh, and again, I'm just the face. So it's a big project, big team, and everyone has their own contribution. So really want to acknowledge everyone's participation. And uh, we have developed a website and you, if you're interested, I'll be around to talk about the project. But before I end, I just want to ask all the MTU students to raise their hands. This is your chance. All right. So this is the students who are working in the water and energy sector at MTU. So the students you're looking for, here are they. And with that, uh, I'll take one or two questions. But again, I'll, I'm around answer any further questions. What's your intention with these units? Are you going to put them at a chapter house for the chapter members to use or are they personal use? No, it's for like you know, public use. So that's why we are working with the chapters. It's not always going to be next to the chapter houses. So that's why we are selecting the livestock wells that are contaminated in collaboration with the chapters. So you can put them at the wells? Yes. And we'll, we are going to leave it there. Have you thought about your security? Yes, so that's the only thing we are asking from the community. No other cost, just make sure you are providing the security. Because we cannot be there every time. So we, and that's why uh, our units are housed inside uh, like, you know, uh, a structure. And that structure can be uh, like, you know, retrofitted into semis. Or if it is scaled down, it can be retrofitted the back of your four by four, like you know, pickup trucks. So, and we get it's portable, so we can take from one community to other. So the whole idea is so that every livestock well has a storage tank as well, or we can get install more storage tanks. So we will be cleaning up the water, leave the clean water for the community. We can move to the next community, but during that time, security is the key. That's what we are asking from the chapter. That's the only thing. And which, which uh, agency you are focusing on? It's both Eastern and Western. Eastern and Western. Not yeah. What about the Central? The thing is, NTU is in Crown Point. Okay. NMT is in Alamo. We first wanted to start local, where our students can go and get familiarized. As I mentioned, like you know, things look very glory, glorious in the labs, right? When you are taking it to the field, things changes. So none of the unit has been deployed yet because of the trust building like you know mechanism but we are almost ready to get like you know uh, in that state but we have selected eastern and western agency chapters so we'll start from there now audition has 110 chapters right so it's, it cannot be addressed within next 5 years right so but we need to start somewhere and this is the beginning and again the members are from the community just clarify again who who makes the units who produces the Pesco. units okay so, and they are here, John is here, and others are here from PESCO as well. So, uh, and like, you know, their facilities in Farmington. So, and these they are in the support. Yeah. These filtration units will only focus on the chemicals, or so the microbial analysis is also something that you are focusing on? 
So microbes, right now we are not focusing because there are, so we have other partners already on board. They have already US EPA drinking water certification to remove microbes, okay? So they said we are happy to give you our units for free. But first, we are focusing on desalination and heavy metal removal. Then the microbial will come uh, at a later part. Yeah, because I just mentioned uh, that Dune College has a similar type of activity going on within the reservation, and we are also focusing on Western and Central Agency. But like our focus is both on chemical and microbial side. Sure. So we will be more than happy to have any kind of Absolutely, and that's that's the whole idea about coming out here, right? There are so many water projects going on across now our nation, but how we are doing it right so that it can serve the community in need. And this is a model we are creating. We are not like you know saying that this is the best unit, right? This is based water, but this is the best model to work with the community because you need to start from grassroots. You cannot just like you know focus on the like you know top down approach. It has to be like you know bottom up. So where you are involving community from the chapters level, because this chapter meetings, trust me, ask my students something. You don't want to be there, okay? <laughs> I don't understand Navajo. They do. So they say they call me Dr. Roy, Dr. Roy. Is good for you. Don't understand Navajo. It's the trust. <laughs> trust me. It's the trust. So that trust building, and uh, when uh, Vice President uh, Montoya was here, and she was there at NMT at our ACES Regional Conference, and she heard about this project for the first time. She heard from the students. The first thing she said, let me know when is your next chapter meeting. I will be there with you. So that's the biggest support we are getting, right? So because that means a lot, right? Because that trust making thing takes time, effort, because it's a student led project, making that trust is easier for us. And NTU is not going to go anywhere. We are an university, and Dine College similarly, right? So we have to work with the community, and this is a model for that. Any, give us any water filtration unit or any project, this, is, this should be the model how you are working with the community. This is something, this is really good. One question I do have is, what do you do with the tractor with the, with That's the, one of the, the lines that end up with that? You clean up, you know, the Perfect, great question. Vice President asked us the same thing. Unfortunately, in our mission, do not have any hazardous waste uh, handling process. So that's why we are working with the state, because now our mission is New Mexico, Arizona. Depending upon the agencies, where you are, you have to follow their state guideline. So we will be taking care of the waste for now, and uh, and then we'll work with now our nation to develop their hazardous waste uh, handling process. So for now, it's in-house. Uh, All right, yeah, I will be around. Thank you so much for being here, and please talk to our students. They are the champion. One more, sorry. <laughs> All right. Uh, with reference to your uh, involvement of high schools, so you mentioned that you uh, did all the activity at Farmington and Gallup. So why not within the high schools within the reservation? No, so we invited everyone. Uh -huh. So that, we, again, as I was telling Kevin, if we want to do anything in Crown Point, we have no place to accommodate them, right? That's why we are yeah, going okay. to this water town, because students are invited from everywhere, okay. every high school. Only thing is we have to make sure we're doing it at one place where they can come and okay. stay overnight. We don't have trust, we don't have any facility on Crown Point to accommodate any number over than three. We have three uh, room hotel on campus and that's our maximum capacity. Right? So that's what. Yeah. Thank you. Let's see, our, our next speaker is Dr. Katie Zemlick. Uh, she is the Hydrology Bureau Chief uh, from the New Mexico Office of the State Engineer. She'll be speaking today on the topic of deep, deep aquifers in the Four Corners region. Thank you. Thank you to everyone who uh, attended today and for the invitation to come and talk with you. Um, so I am Bureau Chief of a very small Bureau of 10 or 11 hydrologists with the Office of the State Engineer, which itself is a small agency of less than 300 individuals uh, scattered across the state. And in general, we're tasked with administering the state's water resources, um, which is a constant and ongoing job. Um, 
I also just wanted to mention that I am also a beneficiary of uh, DOE internships and work. Um, during my master's degree, I was an intern at Los Alamos National Lab, um, and then uh, and then CMD National Lab, and then where I worked as a contractor for several more years um, in this area of the energy water nexus. So it's kind of like a little bit coming home talking about these deep deep aquifers. So <clears throat> when we talk about deep aquifers in the Four Corners region, we're talking about the San Juan Basin. Mike uh, mentioned this before, um, but it's a fairly isolated geologic basin, hydrogeologic basin, that's part of the Colorado Plateau. And you see the basin delineation on the left, and on the right, uh, the surface geology of the basin, which is extremely variable and complicated. And I'm going to talk a little bit about um, sort of how it was formed and how it pertains to these deep aquifers and their quality. So on the left, you can see um, a tectonic map of the formation of the basin during um, Paleozoic and Mesozoic times. We're sort of universally from, you know, okay. north, around, east, south, and west. Um, you have tectonic activity that uh, resulted in the San Juan uplift, mm -hmm. the Nacimiento uplift, the Zuni uplift, and the Defiance uplift. And um, I'm not a geologist, mm -hmm. but it was a really nice drive up this morning. Um, uh, kind of a reminder to me about how unusual this region is uh, and how unique it is um, and how lucky I am to be here today. Um, so this started the formation of the basin into this sort of asymmetrical bowl shape um, where you have outcropping along um, tectonic shifts and this variable surface geology. Um, so the, the principal geologic elements as we start talking about deep aquifers in the basin, uh, in the basin are, were formed during the um, Cretaceous period with the recession of the Western Interior Seaway. So on the left, um, and there's some, some really great hydrologic, paleohydrologic maps out there for anybody who's interested. Um, and then a cross section of the San Juan Basin where you see these large, large sections of the basin deeper in, in green and yellow um, that are marine deposits. And so those deposits tend to be um, uh, you know, characteristic of marine deposits with higher levels of salinity um, uh, uh, from those producing aquifers. And here's another cross section. Um, and I use this cross section a lot. Um, it's from a, a model that was built by the USGS um, in the 90s. Um, and it just really illustrates how, you know, time and geology played in the layering of aquifers in the basin um, and, and, and non-aquifers. So um, it, at least in this bath, which is from um, this 1996 Kernodal report, you have areas that are considered aquifers in a shaded, uh, represented by shading. Um, and then shales, you can see the Mancos shale is very prominent up there. Um, essentially aquitards or um, uh, you know, units that are not considered aquifers. And so um, when I say that this, is, this basin is relatively isolated hydrologically, it's because of the shape of it, it's because of these distinct um, uh, layering that, that occurs with it and, and, and where water is present and its quality. So this is like uh, the brackish water map for brackish water people. Um, so I mentioned I worked on the energy water nexus type of issues um, as a student and then as a, a contractor. Um, this map was generated um, in the mid 60s. Um, it's across the entire United States, generally assessing you know, the presence and general quality of brackish water. And um, early in my career, this is something we used a lot. <laughs> Um, because I think Mike Hightower mentioned that if you're drilling a water well, you're looking for water that you can use. Um, so water wells are not present typically in these brackish water systems. Rather, uh, we often rely on um, 
API wells, which are American Petroleum Institute <coughs> oil and gas wells, where they in, inadvertently, in prospecting for oil or gas among the, some of these shale units, identify brackish water. Um, and so this, this also coincides with the first um, statute, state statute regarding deep wells in New Mexico, um, basically allowing for um, these, uh, a, a well that is appropriating water that doesn't have a water rate associated with it. And so if you know anything about New Mexico water law, um, is that it's based on this idea of prior appropriation. There's a, there's a date associated with that water rate, and there's a value in, in using it first. Um, and also as a state, I've been in New Mexico for more than 20 years. Yes, we have water supply concerns. Um, we acknowledge that our systems into the future may not, may not be able to meet all of our demands and uh, alternative sources of water, like brackish water, that are not as salty as, as um, ocean desalination may provide that opportunity. So here's a nice cross-section. This is from um, Sherry Kelly's group at New Mexico Tech. Um, this was done uh, 2014. This is a cross-section of San Juan uh, Basin that really shows um, by quality um, using well logs, water well logs, and, a, and oil and gas logs to um, generally understand water quality in the basin. And you can see that the yellow, the Ojo Alamo sandstone is generally the, the, the best of the, of the highly saline water. And that as you proceed with depth, um, you have these confining units and then the presence of these brackish water formations. Um, on the right hand side, it's just, it's a, it's a plot of um, the depth of the well um, compared to uh, the salinity. And so salinity is on a log scale, um, shallower Ojo Alamo sandstone, most of the wells are shallower and kind of within the range of, um, many within the range of potability. And the deeper that you go, um, the, the, more, the uh, more saline the water becomes. Um, and also, this is just a comparison of chloride concentration as you go with depth. One of the interesting things about this report from Sherry Kelly's group is that it provided a wealth of data, but it also <coughs> illustrates where we're, we're missing data. And so um, we're relying sometimes on a, a limited number of data points over this really complex geologic basin to um, kind of determine where might be a suitable place to to look for this water, so, um, but it's, it's, it's incredibly useful. So um, I mentioned uh, the mid 60s is when our first statutes on deep wells um, uh, as the Office of the State Engineer came out. Um, in 2009, they got more specific, they were revised. Um, and so, at that time, the, these deep wells were characterized as wells that were greater than 2,500 feet deep and um, whose salinity was greater than 1,000 parts per million TES. And so I probably should go back. If you can kind of look at the scale here with the depth of water in the San Juan Basin, you're talking potentially 12, 10, 12,000 feet deep, depending on where you are in the basin. So definitely many areas in which this is applicable um, and based on that salinity uh, as well. And so really at the time, in 2009, there were many, 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 many applications for these wells. But um, I'll kind of talk about the number in a second. But really, um, it's only been recently that um, it's, it's, they've been put into practice. Um, and there was a lot of interest in, um, particularly in this region, in alternative sources for oil and gas development, but also for mining and agriculture and, and various other activities. And so um, this is a map of, they're called notices of intent. Um, we make acronyms out of everything. Um, so notice of intent to drill a uh, deep well. And so um, you can kind of see there, what, what's kind of interesting, maybe not, is most of them are in the middle Rio Grande. 
And that's generally because the, the, there's such a population center in there, there's compact issues, there's, there's a need for alternative water sources to offset the use of fresh water for activities that you don't need fresh water for. Um, and so that's one easy way. Desalination, of course, is um, an extremely valuable technology, but if you can switch out your water source and use um, a lower quality non-potable water for some type of activity and just not use the fresh water, use it for something else, um, there's a lot of value in that. And so um, almost, almost a thousand of these NOIs have been uh, filed over time. Uh, only six have been drilled. Not all of these have been um, uh, utilized. Um, currently, there's 12 applications, 28 wells in the San Juan, um, compared to the 418 wells in the Middle Rio Grande. Um, and they tend to be, you know, multiple wells at, at one point, in, um, at multiple wells per application. And they've all been used for oil and gas so far, although there are a lot of other ideas on the table currently. Um, and not, not a lot of them are pumping. So they've, they've also, part of the problem is because of lack of data, you don't always know what you're going to get. You don't know what you're going to encounter when you pump the well. Um, and so there have been issues with well integrity and, and things like that. And um, this is just illustrative. So this is the process by which you, uh, applicants go through this NOI process. And I just want to illustrate that with, with the benefit of maybe reducing freshwater use or alternative sources of water or additional sources with, with um, desalination technology, we um, as an agency, but also I think everybody probably in this room, realizes you don't want unintended consequences to occur and there might be some trade-offs. And so this procedure is intended to when you drill these wells and you're producing from more saline formations, to not contaminate fresh water that's there. And um, the intent is to also be able to monitor those wells over time to um, understand you know, their integrity and how that's changed. Um, and to, to, they're very expensive to drill and uh, you would think that it's unlikely to be just abandoned but that issue has happened as well. So this process is our way of uh, trying to ensure that these wells are, uh, when they're put in, they're viable in the long term and um, they're not affecting other, either water quality or um, water quantity of other users. And so this is just an illustration of all of the forms that as a state agency we, we have for, for these things. Um, but probably most importantly is, is the well construction. And if anybody's interested in well construction, we have our agency expert here, Chris Angel over there, um, who, who deals primarily with these wells and, and the processing them um, you know, in a thorough way and, and communicating our results. And thank you. That is all. If anybody has any questions, I'd be happy to answer. Um, typically, we don't get a lot of interest in the abandoned ones because they tend not to be productive. Um, different agencies have various bonding procedures. Ours isn't well developed. Um, and so we try, in the absence of really good bonding, i.e., you've given me money to ensure that the work is done properly, and if you don't do it properly, we keep it and fix it, we try, we have to get out from the front end, which is like thorough review of their well design, um, understanding of where they're gonna be using the water, and to try to make sure all of that's correct, so there won't be a need to abandon it uh, in the future, so. All right, 
Thank you, Katie, and uh, thank you to all of our speakers. Uh, and I want to take a moment now uh, to recognize, I think, the focus of today's event uh, really being on our regional students uh, and faculty. And I, I was curious if I could make a request and have uh, students from today, uh, NTU and San Juan College, uh, as well as uh, associated faculty, stand up uh, just so we could provide a round of applause. networking session poster uh, presenters you know please uh, head over to your posters uh, lunch will be served in roughly 30 minutes uh, so please uh, use the time to check out posters visit the career booths uh, that we have set up uh, and, and build your collaborative networks uh, while you're here uh, this is meant to be highly informal uh, you know don't be shy grab lunch and mingle uh, we'll reconvene uh, here at 1:30 for an afternoon uh, panel session led by uh, Dr. Michael Rinker. So thank you all uh, for, for your attention for the morning session.